Hey, good morning, everyone. It's 6.43 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and it's March the 1st, and it is 2022 years from, from some event. I promise, I want to promise. Could you imagine if it wasn't even 2022 years from anything? That's unimaginable. I don't know. So look, um, I'm following up the last uh, Let's Consider Luke with another one just right away. And usually I don't do that because there's a lot of work that I have to do on it typically. But I had gone over most of Luke's account of what's called the Olivet Discourse. Except for a bit. And I couldn't fit all of it in in the last one. So I really wanted to get all of that done. Um, Boy, and... Here's kind of why. Um, partly because um, this is one of the most, I think it's one of the most used and, and um, possibly one of the most misused bits of eschatological prophecy in the Bible. I mean, this this and Revelation, you know, kind of going hand in hand. And then you got, you know, bits and pieces kind of throughout Paul and, and, and Peter, Jude, and all that. So it's really important. Now, to me, it's not as important that Luke is following Matthew. That's important just from the standpoint of, how consistent are the Gospels with one another, which that is important. But part of this also has to do with the idea I, I started with and, and kept reinforcing as I began this, and that is, what is the context? What is the subject? Because we we want to understand what the context is in Luke's account, we, and we want to understand what the context is in Matthew's account, um, or Mark's, any of the other Gospels. We really want to understand what the context is so that we can see if Luke is deviating, how? If not, and there's actually better information in Luke, we want to understand that too. Context is important. So what we'll do is we will start at Luke 21, 25. Mostly reading through the notes, I will give you the verses from Luke. And then I will go into my notes a bit. Some of these notes are not, again, this is not going to follow just a sort of comparison uh, format. But... I am going to talk about just the uh, the impact of this discourse because this discourse is prophecy. Like the whole thing is prophecy. Unless you're looking at it in Matthew, and Matthew then the next chapter, chapter 25, is not so much, kind of. it's Matthew 25 is like three parables that are, are sort of follow-ups to what was being said in, in Matthew 24. All prophecy here. So it's pretty important. The wording's important, and of course, everybody knows that when I, when I look through passages like this, I'm going to pay attention to things like flora, fauna, Odd words or phrases that stick out. Um, and those things, th those things are not, they're not incidental, and, and I don't find them as tertiary. I, I find those things just as important as any other aspect. Okay, so starting at Luke 21 and 25. And remember, the question put to Jesus is, when would these things happen? These things being 
the destruction of the Beit Yahweh, which is the house of Yahweh, which is what it was called in the Old Testament, not the temple, even though they translate it that way often. When would this happen? Because they saw that as judgment on themselves and their nation and an end. They saw that as the end. Whether they were thinking of, of Daniel 9, in that or not, and they didn't have a good count, and I, I'm not sure why that is. But that's the question. That's the question. And <clears throat> I know in the either the last one, was it the last one or the one before, I did <clears throat> compare the size of what they say is the Temple Mount over there in Palestine, Jerusalem, to what it really should have been. And I maybe a good comparison would be if you think about um, all the pictures and the sometimes we'll get not really much film, mostly pictures of these world's fairs. I would say especially think of, for me, I would think of ones basically in the eastern United States. So the one in Chicago. Uh, let's see, there's one in Detroit. Uh, one in Philadelphia. Those, you could think about just the sort of imagery, the buildings. I mean, what these buildings look like, the, the monuments, uh, the grounds, um, the walks and, and, and stairways, and in some cases, those amazing colonnades. And like, for instance, the Columbia Expedition in Chicago's World Fair had that, um, that, that long wall of arches sort of just right in front of the lake with that inlet of water uh, coming in past it. The, I believe they called it the, uh, the parasol. Amazing looking structures, buildings, decorations, mind-blowing, just beautiful and elegant. And you have to consider these things were built in the first place by the, the greatest, the, and if not the, the wealthiest, um, which I would think because after him, the empire was split into two. So his wealth, his kingdom and everything was divided. So yeah, probably the wealthiest king in the history of, of Israel, Israel or Judah. Um, it would have been, as far as I'm concerned, phenomenal the whole area that he would have set out. And, and like they, they say in the account, uh, in any of the gospels that are, are accounting this, where they're going into this, the, the house of Yahweh. And they're pointing out all of these structures. And then in Luke's account, they're actually pointing out a lot of the designs and decorations really must have been something to see and not anything that you could hope to fit in what they call the Temple Mount in Palestine, Jerusalem. In fact, that might have been one of the displays. <laughs> I don't know what kind of thematic display that would have been. Um, maybe the armory or the uh, potato house. I don't know. So, all right, we'll get going with this. Okay, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Now keep in mind, whenever you hear the word earth in the New Testament, it's very, very likely that in the first place, the word meant to be used, or the word that was probably used in the first place, was Eretz, land. I illustrated this in bringing it together, that when you see Eretz, land, without the specific land of Asher, land of Aram, okay, 
it's talking about the land in which Israel and Judah dwell, the land of Canaan and surrounding areas. That's the land that's focused on all throughout the Old Testament and in all the prophecies that Israel and Judah would be brought back to the land towards the end. Keep that in mind. So when you see the earth, we're not talking about the whole earth. And this is where eschatologically things get really messy. Because people see things like in the New Testament especially, and, and then a lot of times in the old, they'll just they'll just arbitrarily decide instead of the land that they want to put the earth. And I don't know about you, but if I hear the earth, I'm thinking of the whole. I'm not thinking of specifically a a place, a very specific locale. Okay. So and that's, of course, what he would be talking about. Because everything he's talking about is in context of that locale, their home, the land of Canaan, surrounding areas, where our nation lived for well, well over a millennia. And before that, before we took possession of it, our people and Adam kind dwelled in and around that whole area of land, that whole um, continent essentially more concentrated in some areas than than the others and I think all of the evidence points to the greatest concentration of our dwelling in this land being on the East Coast everything east of the Mississippi so then starting in verse 27 and then then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift your heads, for your redemption draws near. Now that last verse, you're not really going to find its parallel in the, in the others, not in Matthew, not in Mark. Now this, what they call the Olivet Discourse, there is a version of it that... <clears throat> actually may even be longer in Mark. It's actually found in Mark uh, chapter 13, and it spans 36 verses of just the Olive Olivet Discourse, and that probably, considering that Luke starts a few verses in, is more lengthy than even Luke's account. Luke leaves a number of things out that you're going to find in, in either Matthew or Mark, and Luke um, injects some things like we saw in the in the last episode, where he he put a few verses from Matthew chapter ten in there. And I don't want to say arbitrarily because I'm sure whoever pieced this together um uh, did what they did with uh it was fully i think they were fully conscious of what they were doing so the interesting thing about this is is this so a lot of people might look at this and i talked about this last time the difference between what we can regard as literal and what we can regard as symbolism I really don't see any reason to regard if he's talking about there would be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars uh, upon the earth, which is probably the land, um, distress of nations, perplexity, the sea and waves roaring. Now, we could go in, we could look at all the wording and find out how well that was all translated. But in general, those terms being used were relatively close, approximate terms. And I just want to bring this up. I'm not saying that there were no signs in the in the sky and, and all that. But I will say this. Um, at least Josephus, if not also possibly, uh, possibly Eusebius. One thing you have to remember, Josephus, Eus Eusebius, uh, Jerome, 
at least those three, and there might be one or two others, the, the, they're all in echo chamber. They all rely entirely on one another to hold themselves up. It's like uh, it's like a building without a strong foundation just floating in the air, those, those writings. But, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure Josephus uh, tries to say that there were various signs happening um in the sky during what he says is the roman siege of the temple in palestine of the jews keep that in mind because if you have somebody as sketchy as josephus and he's affirming things that I don't know if we're looking at something literal. Every time you see words that are concepts that you can find repeated in symbolic or, or figurative ways in the Old Testament, and multiple times, not just once, but at least a few times, I would say that's pretty good evidence to at least lean towards the likelihood that right now we're looking at something that is probably symbolic and then we might want to go and find what the source of those symbols are now a lot of people who have done decent treatments on revelation especially those in 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 the more historicist vein which i i don't agree with because they turn it all into religion and the catholic church and the, you know um but they at least a lot of them treat the uh, the symbolism of the sun and the moon and the stars pretty well because you can go and see that first instance in Genesis um, forty something. It's Joseph's dream of the sun, the moon, and the stars bowing down to him, and it's it's very vivid his description, and it's very clear who he's talking about. He is specifically talking about. Israel, or Israel and Judah, as we can see them now, because they were split into two nations, two houses, which were to be brought back together at the end, by the way. So what I did was I went and I found a few passages just to sort of back this up, that maybe we're not looking at something literal, like, for instance, Josephus, or, you know, there's other writers out there. People use material by these other writers to try to say, well, these were really things that happened in the sky. Um, and I, sometimes I have a hard time believing that people will use some of this stuff because they're such dubious sources. Um, anyways, so some of the parallels to that. Uh, one of them speaking to Babel or Babylon of the destruction of Medi or brought by Medi or Medea, which the rest of the chapter describes as very complete and violent and horrific. Isaiah 13, 10 and 13. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of Yahweh, Sabaoth, or the Lord of hosts, and in the day of his fierce anger. The symbolism is being used concerning... Medea was this nation. They... They came before Paris to attack and overthrow Bebel. It's actually just BBL, so probably more like Bibble, like Bible. Um, which, by the way, was named that because of what? The confusion that happened there. Um, it was Bilal. It was called Babel. Anyways. The next one concerning all the inhabitants of the land, Isaiah 24, 22 and 23. And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in a pit and shall be shut up in the prison. And after many days sh they shall be visited. Then the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed. When Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. 
and before his ancients gloriously. Again, symbolism. Now, concerning the destruction of Pharaoh, Proa of Mitzram, who had been he had been beaten by Nebuchadnezzar years earlier. So there was there was a a, a fast uh, power shift that happened um, right before Judah was carried away to uh, Bibel for those seventy ish years. And what it was was Asher Assyria was holding power in the land. And this um, Peroa Naku, who they call Pharaoh Nico, came up against Asher, beat them, and held power in this place, um, which was actually towards the north in Canaan, which was a really odd place for them to actually have their main base of operations, if that was actually in Palestine. And I illustrate this actually in one of the chapters of my book, but... So what was going to happen was after, because Mitzram was basically coming up for judgment. There was just, there was, it was almost like this domino effect happening on um, Ram, Asher, Mitzram. And then it would be nearly a century before this would come upon uh, Bebel. So concerning this Peroa and Mitzram, Ezekiel 32, 7 and 8. And when I shall put thee out, I will cover the heaven and make the stars thereof dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud and the moon shall not give her light. All the bright lights of heaven will I make dark over thee and set darkness upon thy land, saith. And this is Lord God, so it would be Adani Yahweh. When you see Lord God like that, with the capital L, small O-R-D, and then the capital G-O-D. It's Adani Yahweh. So the last one is found in Joel. And now this is the one that most people would think of because, uh, for one thing, we see this quoted in Acts chapter 2 by Peter. Acts, again, another book written by this author that we know of as Luke. All right? So, in the book of Joel, we don't have a date, by the way. Uh, I think a lot of people just assume certain dates for Joel. There's no date. However, we do see one passage where, um, I want to say it was the, uh, yeah, the, there it is. It's in my notes. Maybe I should read them. So all of Joel concerning a people who've come after many nations have already reduced Judah very little. So the, the whole book starts out with this reduction of the kingdom of Judah. One nation has taken, the next nation took, and the next nation took. And what's left, this next nation will take. That sort of thing. So Joel says, um, Joel does speak of this a day of Yahweh, Yom Yahweh, is at hand. Now, I don't think Yom Yahweh is necessarily one event, but it signals a judgment. If this be so, it must be after Malachi. No date given, but 3.6 says the Palishti known as the Philistines, sold Judah into the hands of the Yuni. And Yun was the third kingdom in this uh, construct of four successive kingdoms. It was the third. Now Joel 2.10, 2 2.30, and 2.31 read, The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. And I will show wonders in the heaven and in the earth, probably land, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord to come. So if we were really looking at these events that he promised to bring upon um, Babel, 
in one uh, instance, all the people of the land in the next instance, upon uh, Peroa, Pharaoh, and Mitzrim in the next instance, and then, um, and then again, Israel and Judah in that final instance, which was a, speaking of something different than the earlier one with Isaiah. I think we have to conclude that it's very strong evidence that we're looking at figurative speech here. And if anyone has recorded that while well, these things happen, these uh, the, these great events in the sky like Josephus and, and I think a couple others who were just following suit, we have to question their veracity because this clearly appears to be symbolic figurative language. Um, now, Luke's account does not include the immediately after the tribulation of those days. Um, Matthew's most certainly does, of course. And um, it provides a lot of context when you do include that immediately after the tribulation of those days. Because if he's plotting out... If he's plotting out a course in the sense that he is giving them the answer of when will these things be, but he's giving them further information. And, and we can see, we'll see as we go through, he's also giving them information about a later time. So we kind of need those signals to understand what's happening, what blocks of text concern a certain event, and so on and so forth. So I think that it's important that Luke leaves that part out. Um, let's see what else I got here. Luke verses 27 and 28, like Matthew. Uh, yes, it has some words that are questionable, which if translated just a bit differently, could dramatically change how we see these sorts of passage. And before I move on to the next chunk of text, maybe I can give you a few quick examples of that. One of the easiest ways to do this, if you want to compare words that are being used. Now, I do have some tools at the website on the resources page so that you can, um, you can do root searches. You can do them in Obery. You can do them in Koine. And I have a Strong's list for either. I have... Uh, transcripts right now in Obery. I'm working on the one with Strong's and Obery, and I will have one at some point in Koine too. So you, you can apply these searches for right now. A relatively easy way to do it, if you have eSword, you can open eSword, you can put it on KJV+. Okay, one term that we're going to have to discuss, maybe a little bit here, I have it in my notes later on. This term, son of man, that shows up a lot, specifically in the Gospels. Now, the way that <clears throat> this term is always framed, and the way that expositors have used it, is they'll say that it's essentially, it is Jesus always speaking of himself in the third person, calling himself Son of Man. Now, if, if they were speaking in Obri, Hebrew, Obri, the term would be Beni Adam. Now, anybody looking at this that would see Beni Adam, they would know, depending on the context, that's important. Context is always important. They could take it as either the Son of Man or Sons of Adam, as in the children of a kind. Adam is a kind. Now, I do find it at least interesting that when you go to the earlier parts of the Gospels, specifically Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you go to the earlier portions of these Gospels and they make it very clear who this Jesus is. Because they call him the Son of David. They call him the Son of God. 
the writers of the Gospels refer to him as the Son of David, the Son of God. The people he interacts with refer to him as the Son of David or the Son of God. Now, what's interesting about those two terms, Son of David, Son of God, is they, those two terms line right up with covenantal prophecy. And he's not, by the way, and he makes this clear too, in the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew, that the peacemakers shall be called Beni Aleim, sons of God. In Greek, it would be Weos uh, Theos. But the son of David, that's remarkably important for him to be known as. But, we're always told that whenever he's using the term son of man, he's referring to himself in third person. Yet, a number of times he refers to himself simply as I, I me. But we're to believe he, he is phasing back and forth and being maybe uh, cryptic or um, putting on, not maybe putting on airs, but just, well, he's pulling this term out, this son of Adam, and the weird thing about it would be, I guess, a couple of things. One thing, if we look at it in the way that most in like Western Christianity have looked at it, that might not be the most flattering term, right? Because this Adam was the one who fell, right? Um, doesn't Paul teach in the book of Romans, this whole sin of Adam and all of that, you know, original sin and everything, the son of Adam, the funny thing is what we find on closer examination in Genesis 2 is Adam, the one that we start following from Genesis 2 forward, his whole bloodline, which Jesus came from, they are a kind. They are a kind of people. We know that because of, for one thing, they're keeping their breeding within their own kind. So they are a specific determined people type. Now, even if they weren't, we can still apply a certain amount of logic to this. Because if he is even possibly, when he says, son of man, He's referring to the Obery term, which they would probably all be using, not this Koine Greek, Beni Adam. What he could in fact be saying is that the sons of a type of people look for them coming and, in this context, what? In a cloud with power and great glory. But the thing about that, because you look at that and you think that's weird what they're the sons of Adam, this kind of man, sons of, so multiple, multiples of them in the plural, coming on a cloud. Well, that's weird. But if you click on the word cloud, you'll see that's this word, nephila. Now, if you use Blue Letter Bible and you punch in that G3507, which is the code for it, You'll see here, Nephela. Nephela has uh, essentially about 26 occurrences. Most of them repeats in the Synoptic Gospels. But the important thing that you can do is, if this is related to another Koine term, a lot of times, not every time, which is why you would want to use, for instance, the um, Koine Strong's list that I've got, because you can search roots in there. You can pick three letters which seem like the heart of the word and you can try different things and you can see what words come up in a search like that. Uh, in fact, I believe I have a decent size uh, prefix and suffix list for, for Koine and you can sort of get the feel throughout these words what might be more of a, a suffix letter or letters and you can start kind of whittling this down and getting to the heart, the root of what this word actually might be. But sometimes you'll get lucky, like this time. 
And you'll see that Blue Letter Bible actually says, well, this word, uh, nephela, comes from a bit shorter, more condensed word, which is nephos. Click on nephos, and you'll see that it says, a cloud, a large, dense multitude, a throng. And if you go down to the one usage of it, you see Hebrews 12, 1, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud, nephos, of witnesses. That term is being used on people. Cloud of witnesses. So obviously it isn't just a puffy thing in the sky. And the thing is, when you start looking at its usage, even in the Synoptic Gospels, you'll see that it's more likely that what is being referred to here, rather than a cloud, as we think of puffy things in the sky, some sort of mass. Some sort of mass. Now, if you take that back to Luke 21, 27, and then, and you just, let's plug in very reasonable terms to plug in. Not unreasonable, not left field. Very reasonable terms. And then shall they see the sons of Adam coming in a throng with power and great glory. And my, does that not change the entire meaning of this passage? And I would say it could start a domino effect that changes our whole understanding of what Jesus was even talking about eschatologically. Maybe makes things that are very ethereal, that are very difficult to understand, far more realistic and easier to understand. Hey, I'm starting again well over an hour and a half later. I've had to take a number of breaks, so I'm definitely losing my momentum. Uh, two things. One thing I did want to correct, <clears throat> it wouldn't be Benny Adam. Benny Adam would be a plural, okay? But if he were saying Ben Adam, he does not have to be referring to himself for one. And I'm going to show you an example here right in the Old Testament. Numbers 23, 19, for instance. It says, God is not a man that he should lie neither the son of man that he should repent. He's describing himself as a kind. It says, U ben Adam. Okay. So, many of the passages, likely all the passages, and I'm going to tell you why, where he's using this term, ben Adam, are not him referring to himself, but him referring to a kind Here's one other reason. And of course, this does change the whole tone, uh, meaning, interpretation of a lot of verses. And at first, we may think, that's that just can't work everywhere. There's all of these places, right, where he supposedly refers to himself as the Son of Man. It can't work in all of those places. But... I would, um, if you haven't, if you haven't listened yet to um, the two Obrey hours that I did on Adam A and Bema, uh, and honestly, even the ones that I did on directions, and I take you through a lot of passages, and I explain to you how this is done. This is done because when you find problem words in passages, this for instance, and you say, ah, there's no way that can work because look at all the words that are around it. Look at the context. Well, that's what you have to do. And you have to do that in every instance so that you understand if they have adjusted the context. Because one thing you're going to find is that nine and a half times out of ten, they do. Now, the other thing I want to draw your attention to concerning this idea of Ben Adam, not Benny, Ben Adam. 
Before we go on, there's one more word. We looked at cloud, and that being more like a mass or masses. And then we're going to look at one more word. The other thing is this. You'll find that as you, as you read through the Old Testament, when a prophet is writing his own book, so if, if anybody is speaking, they're writing in first person, okay? There's really no precedent in Oberim literature for referring to oneself in the third person. But if we accept it as it's written here, we would have to accept that Jesus comes along and he's going to change everything up and start and he's going to be referring to himself most of the time in third person. Which is just kind of bizarre when there's not even a precedent for doing so. Now, some people who might protest that might say, well, God, or however they pronounce his name, he refers to himself in third person. Well, not exactly. In fact, a lot of times what you'll see is literally the prophet is writing the words that he says, and it says, thus says Yahweh, or Nam Yahweh. Um, and if he did, well, you know, he would be an exception because he's Yahweh and Jesus isn't. Um, however, no, most of the time you'll find that in those passages where you would think that even he was referring to himself in third person, it's typically the prophet speaking his words. So the prophet is actually referring to him, not him referring to himself. But let's just talk about men. You're not going to find a precedent for that. You know, they don't run around talking about themselves in third person. They have, there are prefixes, which would be the a, uh, tagged onto the beginning of the word for I, or sometimes the, uh, the ty at the end, t. That could also be a, an I in a different context, or ani. There are ways they have of referring to themselves. And if you look in the Gospels, even in the Koine, you'll see that Jesus himself refers to himself in that same way. But then we've got this sharp changeover where all of a sudden he's referring to himself in third person, like he's gone, um, I don't know, a little weird. So, just to put that in your head. <clears throat> and then one other thing. So, in the next verse, the next verse says, um, after that verse that we just treated, where the Son of Man, which could essentially be talking about a kind, Ben Adam, a kind of race, uh, coming in a cloud, a mass, with power and great glory. That glory does not have to be like, oh, God glory, okay? And then in Luke 21, 28, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draws near. Okay, so the thing about the word being translated as redemption, apolutrosis, we actually can see it for one thing in Hebrews 11.35, it's used as deliverance. Deliverance. And if you go through all of the other occurrences of this word, and plug in deliverance instead, it's very appropriate. Now notice, there are other words for redemption, by the way, in Koine Greek, and there, this word, apolutrosis, only appears, as far as the Gospels goes, in this one verse, or actually two verses? No, the one verse in Luke. So, I would say, based on those factors, that deliverance is far more appropriate. Now, if we plug in these very reasonable other terms, we have them saying something far more along the lines of, they shall see the Ben Adam, the Adam kind, coming in a mass 
with power and great glory or weight or force. Because the, the word kabod that's translated most as glory means it has much to do with weight or force. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your deliverance is near. Your deliverance is near. Why? Because, well, he started out this whole discourse talking about the things that would happen. He said, you're going to see wars, rumors of wars, a lot of terrible things that will happen, and so on and so forth. And he's coming to a point, and he's saying, now, when these things happen, look up, because your deliverance is near at hand. Real physical deliverance, not a rapture. So, now the next thing is, I will probably be able to get through, through this block of text in, in this episode. It is the, in Luke, the, yeah, well, it's in Matthew too, the parable of the fig tree. What Luke doesn't have is the, the cursing of the fig tree, which I might touch on a little bit. So in Luke, it says, and he spake to them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is now near at hand. So it's obvious. So likewise you, when you see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is near at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Before I move forward... I just want to make sure everybody understands that <laughs> I know I'm spending some time talking about the, the terminology used herein because it's important, but that there are marked differences between Luke's account and Matthew's account. Matthew, of course, adding that immediately after the tribulation of these days helps you understand the movement of things that he's prophesying would happen. Okay, I don't want to lose sight of that because that's a big point part of why we're going through these things, but these ideas are, they're pretty powerful stuff in the sense that they've been used a lot by a lot of people to suggest a lot of things. The interesting thing I found out <laughs> about this the difference between Luke and Matthew, they're not, in this case, really gigantic. Um, they are there. They are there. And I'll touch on a few of them, which I think are actually important. They are important, and you will see the difference. Um, but I do want to talk about this idea of the fig tree. Because that's another thing. Um, I went over this. A number of episodes ago because there is a parable in Luke in which he talks about a guy who had a vineyard and he had a fig tree in that vineyard and it didn't produce fruit that's only in Luke by the way <clears throat> and then there's another uh, part where only in Luke that um, that one guy climbs up a tree so we had to look at types of trees and I'm always going to look at those things for a lot of reasons. Now, it has been widely taught that the fig tree represents Israel. And I believe to this day they actually use that over in uh, the Phonius Notrael as uh, like their symbol, besides the six-pointed star. <laughs> um... So in this case, I don't know that it would so much be Israel, it would have to be Judah. Because, see, that the house of Israel, they've been gone quite a long time, actually. There was only, at best, there was only a remnant of them. Though, yes, um, if the people that were left were mostly Judah, and they would be mostly Judah because the son of David would come through the line of Judah. But also Benjamin 
and Levi. They would be considered, of course, Israel. Technically, yes. Um, but the, predominantly, the people that would have been populating the land would have been Judahites. I mean, they, everything suggests that they would be in the majority. So the word here again, we've seen this before, is suke in koine. From G4810, sukan, which they do translate as fig, said to be from an unknown primary root. And every time you see that, if you're looking up a word and it says from an unknown primary root, you should be suspicious. In Obri, the words, because there's so many Obri words that have been transliterated for whatever, I don't, honestly, at this point in time, I really don't know the reasons. Yeah, I can make guesses, but I don't know how educated those guesses would be. In Obri, the words having to do either with an end Q or an end K. So those would be the two letters that are going to give that sound if we're looking at something in the proximity of suke okay um they would be suck shuck suck and zek and they're all widely varied the k ending words however have more to do with striking even sometimes having to do with um penetrating uh, for instance, um, uh, what is it? I don't think I wrote it down in here. Um, I want to say it's, yeah, I want to say it's shakab, which is actually the word for e sexual intercourse. I mean, it, it specifically means having sexual intercourse. When you see that K, if the K indeed does symbolize the hand, and you start cross-referencing words with that K there at the end, it literally means strike, like the, the simple bi biglyph root ek or yik literally means strike or smite. So when you see these words that start to have this NK, they do have a lot more with striking, penetrating, something like that. Um, thus the K, if this was a suke, or sugar tree because that word zucker came from somewhere and I think it's actually just a slightly varied form of what somebody once called sweets or sugar and it just ended up sticking in the German zucker so anyways the suke to Judah the word used for fig tree is h8384 in the Old Testament, that's the word they translate as fig tree, okay? And it's ta'ane. It's interesting that the fir, not fig tree in German, is ta'ane nimbaun. There's the N at the end, but it has that exact lettering, tanen baum. That's the fir tree. However, do we know tannenbaum always means fir tree. And this is where it gets kind of interesting. The prefix tannin is said to be tan, which doesn't make sense because the bark of most trees is brown or tan, most of them. Okay, so how can they just be talking about the fir? And the leaves of the fir are not tan or brown. They never get tan or brown, thus the term evergreen. So why they... <laughs> insist that they're speaking of specifically a fir tree. Anyways, there are a lot of dubious German words that are just used, and they've probably been used for so long, and there's probably a lot of finagling in the German for the last couple hundred years, just like there has been with English as of late, to confuse terminology. The German word for brown is braunen or braun, like Eva Braun, not an uncommon J surname by the way, um, it's not uncommon either for 
someone who is acting as the agent of the powerful people running the world to be given a female plaything. This actually helps to sort of keep them in line and they can report back to them. And it's a really common thing. Eva Brown. Brawn. Brown. And yes, Brown is a really common J surname. Now, and you know, she was actually an actress too. Anyways, there are no good approximations for this in German, Latin, or Greek, but the obery ane, and the target word is tane, could easily have to do with something that seeps or goes. We may be looking at one of about 100 trees, uh, tree sap, is it, oh, sorry, trees that sap is extracted from and used for food or medicine. So, as in the parable of the vineyard, which is, like I said, only in Luke, G290 Amphalon, which has oddities if it is vine or vineyard, but possibly, more likely, orchard. Um, because why is a good fruit tree in the, the vineyard? Cutting down a tree, as in Luke, is permanent. As in no tree growing back. Cut it down. Burn it. Get rid of it. Okay? That's the whole point. And that's the point in the parable, is cut it down. <laughs> so, as in no fruit forever Herefore, forever, from Matthew, even let no man get fruit from the forever, from Mark. Now, this is where he said to curse this tree. It's different than the Luke treatment, which is a parable. Very different. But all permanent, whereas Israel slash Judah have promises of redemption and therefore fruit. If you're going to bear fruit you cannot be destroyed or cursed from ever bearing fruit forever. Now, the question is, why would he, Jesus, expect anything? Now, the texts don't actually say fruit. It actually says he came to f see if there was anything on that tree to be gotten. Now, except Luke's lone parable, but G2590, Carpos fruit, which is used in that one parable of Luke, um, it's used like the Obery Pari, which is actually product, not fruit. Okay, so we still don't necessarily have a fruit tree. What product would he expect to find in the early spring? Because it would have to be the early spring. Because this all happened before his passion, which had to have happened in March or April, if we're to believe the calendar, which, you know, I've gone over this before concerning when the um, equinoxes and solstices happen and when would the most likely beginning of the year based on the feasts be. And I, to this day, still maintain that them starting in spring is absolutely just the most likely thing. Not saying I won't ever change my mind, but that's really the most likely. So, this would be before then. This would probably be in March at best, maybe early April. Um, now, the thing is, citrus can grow two seasons and tolerate down to 20 degrees Fahrenheit, and many evergreens have bright red berries throughout the wintertime. But it says he got close to see if there were any thing. The wording's anything. If he had to get close, I would assume he were looking for nuts, not berries or fruit. If nuts, which is still a product, and it's really considered a fruit because it is the fruit of a tree just like a number of things that you extract from the tree are fruits of the tree the black and white walnut um the white walnut is actually somebody help me butternut uh the white walnut fruit they fruit both of those trees in winter and both 
are sap trees. You can extract a sap from them, which would make sense calling it a sukkah. If we can, if we can reasonably believe that the zukkah in German came down to us from using this word suke as a sweet tree. Um, so what do we have? Now, the interesting thing is both of those trees are found pretty commonly in the Midwest. Not so much in Palestine whatsoever. Um, both, yeah, as I said, both would qualify as the Ta'ane too from the Old Testament being essentially like flowers and have fruit in winter slash spring. But what would the tree represent? Since he's talking about a tree putting for leaves at a point, because he does say, you know, when the, when it buds forth. We're, we're talking about, okay, whether whether the wording he used actually meant bud or, or something else, or, you know, putting forth its leaves, budding forth fruit, whatever. The thing is with the evergreen, it's just, it's not really doing that. Um, again, that's why it's an evergreen all year. Um, nor are we looking at something that should have multiple seasons. He's talking about it budding, so at a certain time, a one season tree. Um, now if, if he curses the fig tree in Matthew and Mark, he says, ton Iona. This is what's important. So let's say he curses it. He comes along to this tree, which is more likely some type of sap tree, which had some product that he came to see if it was producing. Maybe it was just sap. It doesn't say. It's a product. We're talking about a product. He came to see if it was giving forth a product. Could have been nuts. Could have been sap. You can collect both at that time. Uh, but anyways, what does he say to him? He says, ton Iona. When he says, he curses it and says, you shall produce no more fruit or man shall not get any fruit from you. The, the term he's using is toneona, this age. That's really important. May it be fruitless for the remainder of this age. He was telling the disciples about the end of that age. That's the whole context of this passage, by the way. Um, and a matter of fact, sorry, as a matter of fact, I'll click on this word real quick and we'll just see. So, in there. So it's just before all of this in Matthew and Mark that he sees that fig tree and he curses it. And he says, you should not produce figs anymore. Something crazy is going on. Oh, I don't know why that was happening. Okay. So, yeah. You shall not produce any more fruit, ton Iona for the rest of the age. Okay, let me put it to you this way. If the age was about to end like he was prophesying to his disciples that it was about to end, 10 years, 5 years, 10 years. If we go by Daniel 9, literally the end of the age should have come pretty fast after the DBR, death, burial, resurrection. Pretty fast. So even if the suke represented Judah or Israel, all of Israel, 
And he said, no more fruit. He curses it. No more fruit to the end of the age. Withered up and died. So a judgment now, because he was right at the end of that, that whole prophecy that Daniel prophesied is 490 years, 77s, 77s. Never mind. <laughs> He's right at the end of that. Was it a sign? Probably. To the end of the age. That age. What's that age? Probably that age defined by Judah being in the land. There were prophecies outstanding that if Judah didn't fulfill certain things, they were done. Done. And they had been in the land for over a millennia. And now they would be done. And that's definitely the end of an age. Ton Eona. Um, so, I did write in my notes, in addition, um, when the tree blooms, winter's at an end, and it's a different age. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, just concerning a couple of, maybe a little smaller notes on some of these things. I'm going to try to see where I'm at. Verse 31. I wrote verse 31. It's speaking after the trauma of all the preceding verses. And that's probably nice, but... Um, I'll go with that. And in, in that sense, it's it's actually right in line with Matthew. Because everything he's spoken up till now is actually it's pretty pretty heavy stuff. So you know, in a sense, this might be um the silver lining. And not of the kind of cloud that we just looked at. Now, in 32, uh, I wrote as quite possibly a reassurance that their race or tribe will not go extinct. Uh, not that those things would be fulfilled in their generation. Am I at that verse already? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I'm sorry. Yes, I am. So th there's an interesting thing here. So he does use the word genea, um, which has a whole lot more to do with genetics, genea. Okay. Um, then necessarily like the generation is in, you know, the three score and 10 X generation X boomers. Okay. Um, and it's, it's very possible that what he's doing is telling them that the generation, as far as those people who existed there at that time, perhaps Judah as a nation and perhaps Judah, Benjamin and Levi had, had in a sense, uh, congealed so much that they all identified, in a sense, as Judah. Um, because remember, for one thing, there's Jacob's prophecy about Judah. Not about Judah, I'm sorry. Uh, Levi and Simeon, that both of them would essentially lose themselves and in, in the rest of the tribes be absorbed. Uh, now, were all the Levites absorbed in that way? No, but I mean, eventually, if all of this was going to happen, that's exactly what I would have expected to see. So I don't think necessarily he's saying that, like, um, if they were a generation that he was talking to, say, his disciples, they were in generation A. <laughs> I don't know, B, because it was a long time ago. I don't think he's saying that. I think he's specifically saying generation as in their kind their specific tribe and ethnos, except in this sense, he's saying Ganea. Um, and then concerning verse 33, perhaps he's saying, when he says heaven and earth would pass away, but my words won't pass away, perhaps he's saying something very much like mark my words. And when he uses a term like heaven and earth will pass away, we saw some of that language actually in those previous verses that I started out with. Um, 
in a sense, drawing a contrast. In a sense, drawing a con contrast. Even if heaven and earth passed away, what he's saying, you can bank on. Okay, so the one big difference here in Luke that we, we see different in Matthew, and I'm pretty sure Mark actually has this as well. So in Matthew, or I'm sorry, in Luke, what he tells them is that when they see these things, to know that <laughs> the kingdom of God is near at hand. Um, and that's, I'm sorry, that's in 31. And I, so yeah, I'm doubling back. When you see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is near at hand. I'm just giving you the biggest contrast right now between them. Um, Matthew is, it's quite different because in Matthew it says, so likewise you, when you shall see these things, know that it is near even at the doors. I find that to be a pretty big difference in the sense that, um, well, unless this is Yom Yahweh, which is, it's a term, of course, used for, and I just, I, I went over that earlier, the day of the Lord, um, typically judgment. Um, it would have, like, it would appear to be a consolation, um, an end uh, to it all. But what does he mean then by Luke 21.32, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away until all be fulfilled. Uh, going in that order, because first he says, uh, when you see these things, know that the kingdom of, of God is near at hand, and then know that this generation shall not pass away, which we just went over till all things be fulfilled. And then his last verse is, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. It's possible that he is just following that logical progression of um, when you see all of these things, know that the kingdom... And I don't know why Luke is using, or whoever wrote it, is using that uh, sharply different... No, just really different terminology, but it wouldn't necessarily go against terminology that we've seen before, at least in him. You know, Luke is the one who uses um, kingdom of, of God, uh, whereas Matthew, you're going to see uh, kingdom of heaven. Or did I get that backwards? No, it's God. Okay. Um, so starting with that, kingdom of God near at hand, right on till um, this generation, as in this people, wouldn't pass away until all these things are fulfilled. And I, I don't even think that that's really good wording, the until all things are fulfilled. Um, more as in these things, in the progress of these things being fulfilled, we could count on the generation not passing away. And then finally, it is a, a very solid mark my words passage at the end there. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And let's see. Okay, so I am going to run through the last uh, five verses in this whole um, discourse according to Luke. Now, I don't have a, a Matthew or Mark to uh, compare these two, and here's why. Because at this point, when we get to Luke 21, 34 through 38, it's just such a radical departure from what we'll see in, in Matthew and Mark. I guess some could argue that it was a massive condensation of Matthew and Mark. I, I guess you could. It is a little bit. I mean, it, it does have kind of the same sort of vibe in the sense that like uh, 
34 and 35, verses 34 and 35 say, Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting, which we don't see that word very often these days, and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that day come upon you unaware. What day? The day of judgment, right? No, I'm not talking about afterlife judgment. I'm talking about he's this whole time he's describing very real events to come very soon. That day. Because I think he's, at this point, he's swinging back around, summing it up. As according to this account, I'm not saying the same uh, movement in the same way is happening in every account. Because, like, for instance, in Matthew, there's, there's far more detail um, of what things were going to be like before this time. Okay, so anyways, uh, verse 35, For a snare shalt it come on them that dwell on the face of the whole. There we got earth again, probably just the land. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before, here we go, the Son of Man. And then the next two verses are just the description. They say that the day... He was teaching in the temple, and at night he went out and abode in the mount. Okay. So I'm not really going to read the first part of my notes, because we've covered that already concerning Yom Yahweh, the day of the Lord. Um, here's an interesting thing concerning the perspective. And yeah, in a way, <laughs> I'm kind of, I'm not really, but possibly defending just the language used uh, by Luke in there. I think there were enough, I really do think there were enough variances in Luke's account of the discourse for us to raise eyebrows over easily. The, the biggest point to doing all of this was not entirely showing those problems between one um, gospel and the other. Though there are, they're there, and I pointed them out. The funny thing is about the oddity of him using a few verses ago, the term, the kingdom of God. And the reason being is because everything I saw up to that point very much sounded like we were looking at something that should be more in the terminology of Yom Yahweh. Uh, and I guess the interesting thing about that is this. We do see in the prophets this description of this Yom Yahweh, the day of the Lord, that give us a clear indication that it is, it is a very welcome and good thing to those who are, who are righteous, who love Yahweh, who are, are living well. It is, a hopeful expectation because for one thing what it means is the end of all of the wickedness going on around them and a righteous man suffers when he is surrounded by wickedness for all of those behaving wickedly the day of the Lord would be a very terrible horrible thing and I know this for a fact because if you point out to somebody that all of the signs are really adding up to things coming to an end pretty fast. They do not have a joyful expectation of that, because indeed they do love the world. They, they like it just fine the way it is. And that's a fact. And that's honestly... <sighs> Even a lot of the people that say they don't, they have an idea of something different that involves basically being whisked away to a great banquet feast, and I don't know, they're going to be all pumped up on morphine and Xanax, get a cloud and a harp, and I, I just think their perception of what a lot of these things really mean or entail has been heavily skewed 
by the language, the interpretation, and the exegesis, if you want to call it that, of all of this. So it is kind of a perspective thing, though it is still weird that Luke used that terminology. Uh, we also, we got to be careful with with or which passages we interpret as um, Jesus' words when he uses the Son of Man. And this we've gone over. I told you I covered it later on. Now here's something interesting. I did highlight verse 20, uh, 36. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Okay. Well, <clears throat> if Son of Man is actually Ben Adam, and he's not speaking of himself in third person, but he's actually talking about a specific kind of people. If you understand the way that, for one thing, Obri is constructed, standing before, if you saw a passage that would say someone stood before, which would be um, not Nago, ah, oh, that's close, Yeneg, something like that, which would be to stand or announce, it means to, it could mean stand or What's the, the other word I'm looking for? Endure. That you may be able to stand, as in endure, before this Ben Adam. So again, I'm trying to tell you that at first you may think, yeah, but there's just no way I can, I can insert that Ben Adam, as in a specific race or kind of people, and have it work you'd be surprised. You would be surprised, because I've been surprised, because I would, I, a lot of times thought the same thing until I started having to plug these things in and look at every single passage in its context and the surrounding wording. Um, let's see what, what else I've got here is, um, well, uh, for one thing, Christos, okay? Anointed. And then we go into the Old Testament and we see and I'm comparing this to the New Testament all the times you see this word Christos and that it it means anointed, right, in Koine. But then you go to the Old Testament and you see that anointed is used frequently on either Israel or Israel and Judah or specifically the servants of Yahweh. So when you see Christos, it doesn't always have to be referring to this one man, Jesus. Um, let's see. I think this last point I already covered. Um, oh, what? Okay. I guess kind of one more little perspective on my words will not pass when he says that. Now he does say that in Luke: "Heaven and earth will pass, but my words will not pass away." Is he talking about the Bible? Or what he's saying there and then? And I would say he's talking about what he's saying there and then and not the Bible, but a lot of people have thought because of certain books and because we tend to combine little bits and pieces or aspects of all these different four Gospels together, um, and we kind of take what we want to away from all of that, all of this piecing together, this cherry picking. Um, like, for instance, the uh, the prayer in the Gospel of John, which appears nowhere in, in any other Gospel. Um, that area, he does talk a lot about my, and he, and he also says to his disciples, keep my commandments. And a lot of people have equated that to the commandments that we find in the Old Testament, and I would not. Um, so, yeah, I have to say that he is speak, speaking of his words like mark my words, because for one, we don't have any evidence that he wrote the Bible. The prophets inspired wrote the Bible, not him. To believe he wrote the Bible, you have to believe he is God or some form of some demigod or something not easily demonstrable in the text. Especially if you disregard Paul 
then it's just case closed. In fact, when I've, I've listened to many, many debates between, typically you'll just find Unitarian and Trinitarian debates. Um, and the Trinitarians rely more on Paul for every, uh, for about every New Testament doctrine that doesn't make sense or isn't very provable with the Old Testament. They're going to rely heavily on Paul. It's, uh, it's all Paulianity. Um, oddly, all the passages wherein Jesus deliberately says these words aren't mine, and this is where it gets really weird, they're in John. They're in the Gospel of John. All these passages where he keeps saying that those aren't his words and so on and so forth. John, not the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, and I got to just wonder if that's because in those three synoptic Gospels, it was a foregone conclusion that of of course he isn't God. But John, maybe not. And maybe we'll um, consider John another time. So with that, we're through Luke 21. When we pick up with 22, we'll be back into, uh, I think, a far more consistent, contrasting sort of scheme like we've been doing, but again, I thought it was important to address some of these points in the so-called Olivet Discourse. So until next time.